Hello, everyone, and welcome to another author interview here on Tales from the Wandering Scribe. I'm your host, Gabriel Garcia, otherwise known as the Wandering Quill and the Wandering Scribe. And today we have another guest making their official debut from L.A. Comic Con. My guest today is an Amazon bestselling author in action adventure fantasy, dark fantasy, sword and sorcery, African-American fantasy, and African literature. He was born and raised in Los Angeles, though he spent one year in Fort Lewis near Tacoma, Washington, while his father served in the U.S. Army. He currently lives in L.A. with his girlfriend and cat, and he produces videos all over YouTube, including his own channel, which you should all check out, and I will post a link down below. He's also an audiobook engineer, and he is the author of many incredible stories, one of which that I have is by Sea and Sky, The Sky Pirate Chronicles. So to tell about this book and the many more, let's give a huge round of applause to today's guest, author Antoine Vandela. Antoine, thank you so much for coming on the show. Hey, thank you for having me. And I have to say, I love your background. I love what you have behind you, um, Antoine. So before we begin, is there anything else you would like to share with our viewers and listeners about your background, uh, anything in particular growing up, or will we find that out later? I'm sure that's going to come out in the natural course of the conversation. All right. Well, viewers and listeners, I I just have to say this. When I met um, Antoine at LA Comic Con this year, his booth was incredible. Among the many booths that I had the opportunity to see, the books that he writes are, you know, just, I can't say enough good things uh, about it. So, Antoine, as a little teaser for our viewers and listeners, can you give us a little excerpt about one of your books, this one in particular, by Sea and Sky, The Sky Pirate Chronicles? Well, Basin and Sky is about a uh, married couple. They've been married for a little while. Um, one of the um, the, the husband uh, gets a disease uh, called stone skin, uh, which cannot be cured, but it can be mitigated. And so the wife has to administer all these potions for, you know, months and months until she runs out of money. And, you know, when you run out of money, what do you do? You become a pirate. <laughs> and mm-hmm. so in her first year of being a pirate, she discovers the very first airship to exist in this world and thus begins the Sky uh, Sky Pirate Chronicles. Awesome. And as I said, viewers and listeners, Antoine has like a, a plethora of amazing books that we'll probably talk a little bit about on this uh, interview. Before we get to that, let's dive into our guest's background. So Antoine, tell us a little bit about yourself. Were you always a creative person growing up? How did your journey to crafting your own stories come about? Uh, yeah, I, know, I was always creative as a kid. Um, and I really enjoy that my mom nurtured that. It wasn't like a, oh, no, don't do that kind of thing. It was like very much like, yeah, no, let's see what you can do with this kind of thing. Like putting me into programs, always like, you know, having me write my stories or taking me to like office depots, like laminate my stories so they look like all official and stuff <laughs> like that. Um, but then for a long time, I did not write. Like I remember the last like big thing of like the universe telling me, hey, you probably should write was when I was graduating from high school, I went to a program called Inner City Filmmakers. Um, and in that program, they had a screenwriting scholarship, basically. Um, so like, there was like maybe like 40, 50 kids in the program. And so like at the end of the year, like, you know, we all submit our screenplays, things like that. And I got and I got like the first place and I got like the, the screenplay. And, I was, and so the universe was telling me, you should probably write. And I was like, nah, I'm going to go and like be a director or something like that or like do YouTube content creation. And like a lot of time and then I went to like a university. Uh, I uh, majored in multimedia at uh, Cal State Northridge. And my writing teachers was like, you should be writing. And I was like, nah, I want to do YouTube, you know. And then so I didn't do it for a long time. It wasn't until I uh, watched the final season, not final season, it was a uh, season six. Game of Thrones, whatever, whatever the season where, spoiler alert, uh, Jon Snow, like, you know, 
falls in the snow with a bunch of blood. I'll just say that. Um, right. And I was looking up. I was like, hey, is this anything? Is there like a Game of Thrones that's like set in Africa or set around African mythology? Um, so now I started doing some research and I started reading um, a lot of new books that I wasn't aware of, like uh, N.K. Jemisin and uh, Nettie Okorafor. Um, but they weren't exactly the books that I was looking for. Um, and mm. as you know, the, the typical thing you'll hear from writers is that um, uh, the reason why they write is because they the book that they wanted to read it didn't exist, so they just wrote it for themselves. And that's essentially how I got started um, with with uh, writing uh, first with a tale called the Kishi, which is um, apparently my brother. He's really into Dungeons and Dragons, so right. I remember he sat me down and he was like, "Oh yeah, this is like a mythological creature that sometimes I use in my campaigns where um, my." Uh, my party will face the kishi and like well i was like oh what's the kishi she's like oh it's like some african mythology from like southwest africa so i did like you know the research for that and like created a whole story around that and a whole world around that that expanded out to all the rest of my books including by seeing sky like uh the the main character in the kishi novel is a former pirate trying to become a pacifist monk and the pirate crew that he used to roll around with is the pirate crew that we follow in by seeing sky nice so now from that jumping off point what was your aha moment when you realized that this could be a career for you to really grow your brand as an author and showcase who you are in the publishing world uh it probably was with uh so my young adult series which is the the, the picture behind me tj young and the orishas um mm -hmm. that one got picked up for a uh, movie adaptation. So I would Ooh. say that was probably, and that was in 2021, I wanna say, is that when I was acquired? Um, maybe 2022. Um, that was probably the point where I was like, oh, okay. I think people like my stories and I think that they are impactful and they probably can, you know, do something crazy with it. So like when that happened, I was like, okay, I'm probably on the right path and the universe telling me that I should write, probably should listen to it long time ago. <laughs> Cause I could have <laughs> been, you know, doing this stuff a, a lot sooner. Um, Cause I basically wasted my twenties like, being on youtube basically and not writing wow that's that is incredible and i do have a question i do want to ask you but i'm gonna save it to the business portion because i think it's more appropriate so now let's jump ahead into the future of you so once you sat down and you began writing your stories ultimately this is a two-part question what were the goals you had going forward with all of your stories but also what were your goals and promises to your future readers? Oh, that's a big thing with me is that I don't usually have those kinds of goals in mind. It's very mentioned that too, because I'm actually talking to like a marketing expert right now, like on mm -hmm. Facebook. He's asking me all these questions like, what are your goals? I was like, I don't know. I just like put books out and hopefully people read them kind of thing. You know what I mean? Like I'm not a very business. I mean, I, I am business savvy and that, I think that's the reason, a large re reason why, um, you know, my, my books do well and stuff like that. But I think that's because that's just like, more of a natural ability than it is like a concentrated effort like i never had a, mm -hmm. a, a super concentrated like marketing business effort but i feel like i right. have to now because now as you get older and you have more responsibilities and you have to like oh i actually have to like bring in consistent money then you have to like you have to start doing that but naturally i don't do that i'm actually very bad at that. i'm actually right before our interview call i was just on um um doing a pitch meeting with um a publisher um and it was my first time having to like think about like you know like super business and like oh right is this marketable and things like that you know but generally speaking you know i don't write with specific goals in mind um, well i will say that um the one thing that readers come to expect from me and it's like what i always do is i write very rich characters um mm. and i write with the brand of African mythology. So all of my um, stories have African mythology tied into it in some way or another. Definitely, 100%. And again, I really wanna ask this question, but I'm gonna save it for the business side. Mm -hmm. So I guess that's, well, that's kind of like a little, you know, teaser to that question. Whenever we think of like, you know, fantasy, the fantasy genre, we always think of, you know, medieval Europe or somewhere in your for a fantasy medieval setting but we never really think of you know fantasy in other places uh fantasy world that's based off of the han dynasty or fantasy saying that's based in japan or even a fantasy saying based in one of the uh, countries of africa we really never considered that but i have to say um antoine from starting to read by sea and sky i am just blown away by you know the world building and it's just so 
incredible. It's so rich, as you said, the world building, the characters. It's so. It's just. It makes me really think. Why hasn't story? Why haven't stories like this existed before? And again, that will lead into the next question. But I think from here as a jumping off point. What was the initial reaction like from your first set of reviewers when you published your first book? Because I would imagine it was a little daunting and intimidating at first seeing like all these strangers review your work, a passion project that you've been working on for a long time that then jump started this career for you to make, you know, incredible stories. So were they positive, negative, or somewhere in the middle? Oh, it was definitely for my first book. It was definitely positive. Like I remember, I put it into some indie author award and it became a finalist and stuff like that. I remember, like people really praising the the opening chapter because it's like a it's a murder mystery kind of a thing, you know, at the beginning mm-hmm. of that book. And like it starts off with like the murder and people being like, "Wow, this like first chapter is like super engaging," you know, kind of stuff. And that was like my first chapter I've ever written for a novel. Period, you know, because uh, before I was writing screenplays and like YouTube scripts and things like that. Um, uh, so it was very encouraging. And also, I realized because I, you know, went into the indie space, how prevalent the subgenre that I was writing in, which is like African mythology and right. sword and soul and stuff like that, is in the indie space. Like it's not as prevalent in like the traditional um, publishing space, but it's right. all over. Like it, it, indie, it's all over. Right. That's actually really, really incredible. And from there, would you say that the reviews? validated your goals in the sense that you know you want to tell rich stories stories that encompass you know the continent of africa or maybe at least one part of africa whether it's west african mythology east african mythology or even just you know an aspect of like african mythology maybe it's like the gods goddesses Mm -hmm. folk heroes and so forth yeah no for sure like there was one movie that i probably will never forget this um, young lady who was from Angola, which is where the or Angola, which is from the where the Kishi comes from, mm-hmm. she said that she like welled up and cried when she read it because uh, she remembered her grandfather who had passed, um, telling her the story of like the Kishi and like right. you know, her to see it like a novel. And I was always really when I first learned about the Kishi and stuff like that, I was like, wait, how does this not exist? There's a there's, there's a uh, a mythological creature that's like kind of like a vampire, handsome man in the front of the face, but then he hides a hyena in the back of his head, um, woos women, stuff like that. I'm like, how is this not already a story? Like, how does this not exist out in the world? Like, why do I, why do I not see more like Kishi out there? Like, why do I always see like vampires or you know whatever else it is? Um, and for her to be like, oh man, yeah, like I nearly forgot about the story because it was something that was told orally to her by her grandfather, and for her to mm. see it like in a novel form, you know, in an audiobook and in a, in a print book, you know, like it, it was a really incredible experience for her. So like that was like super moving to me. In a way, she almost found like herself being, you know, represented in a story, or at least an aspect of her culture being represented, and that itself is very moving and powerful. Mm-hmm. And that also kind of leads into the next question which is a more personal question and it's the first reflective question which is this so as i'm sure you would definitely agree antoine you know writing a book it's not an easy thing to do it's not a get rich quick scheme no matter what anyone says on social media it's not not, if you're trying to get rich don't don't become a writer (laughs) like i'll tell you that right now if you're trying to be rich don't be a writer yeah it, it it's not it's hours of planning years of editing and just getting everything formatted not to mention cover artists you know isbn numbers formatting Mm -hmm. your book no matter Mm -hmm. which one you go to there is going to be some cost to it and then now especially in the digital age it's a way a double-edged sword yes it allows a lot of authors you know from traditional publishing whether it's the big five or the small presses independent uh authors or hybrid authors it allows us a platform to showcase our work but now more than ever especially on social media the anxiety is you know through the roof in the sense are people going to you know accept this are people going to be open-minded to this story and give it a chance and then the imposter syndrome is Mm -hmm. ever there and really making us reconsider should we be doing this nobody's going to read a story that's like this. So for you, uh, Antoine, when you began this journey of yours, did you have those thoughts? And if so, what does discipline you 
to create so many different stories in different series and to just keep going. Uh, the big thing for me is to not think about it in its totality because you can easily get overwhelmed thinking like, I have to write this entire series or this entire book. I'm like, nah, just think about like the chapter. Think about the scene or think about the sentence that you're working on. Um, if you if you break it down into like its little tiny components, it becomes way less daunting than if you're thinking about the entire package. Sometimes it happens like I'll forget and I'll be like, oh, yeah, like I'll be stressing about something like about a deadline or whatever. Um and I'm like, oh, no, but this whole entire thing needs to be done. It has to be like a, you know, 15 hour audiobook or whatever. Like, what am I going to do? I'm like, don't worry about it. Like, just think about the sentence that you're editing right now. Like, you know, like, you don't don't think about all of it all at the same time or you will explode. Yes, that is, you know, 100 percent true. I think now more than ever, especially on social media, we're always looking to see are people going to like it? Are people going to enjoy it? And, you know, generally speaking, as authors, it's not going to have like, you know, Sometimes you have an overall positive, sometimes you have an overall negative, sometimes it's 50-50. We can't really get bogged down by the reviews because at the end of the day, it's by the readers who are enjoying our stories, who are passionate about the work we bring out and showing our voice to, you know, these strangers who are, you know, willing to take our works and enjoy them. And now that leads into the business side of being an author, which I'm very excited to hear your thoughts on, Antoine. Mm -hmm. So as a little icebreaker, for you, when you began your journey um, as an author, I imagine you did like a lot of research mm -hmm. into publishing houses to see, okay, which ones are the best ones, and maybe possibly considering going the indie route uh, if the thought ever came up of like, okay, maybe a publishing house may not be open to a story like this, so maybe I may go the independent route. So for you, um, Antoine, where did you find yourself going on this path of yours as an author? So I didn't even consider uh, the traditional path at all. Like not even, oh, never, okay. it never even crossed my mind. Um, and I think a lot of that is because um, like I majored in multimedia um, at Cal State mm. Northridge. So um, I learned like different aspects of, um, cause at that time, like that's when it was emerging. Like, hey, you need to learn like multiple things in media. Cause you have to like be mm, a jack of all trades. Okay. So I had like my writing class and I also had like a Photoshop class where I had uh, Final Cut Pro, uh, which is like an editor program, um, uh, After Effects and graphic design, stuff like that. So you, you learned all of that at my college um, or my university. And um, I took that and I just propelled myself into like my own business, right? So I did that right. for social media, YouTube content creation. And I also did like, you know, um, independent contract work for like editing, stuff like that. So I never, like I never really, cause and, and I think because I had, gone from like a tr traditional job to then becoming like a YouTube content creator working for myself. Um, I always had the mentality of like, well, yeah, why do I need like, you know, validation from like some, some somewhere else when I could just do it myself. And now the, the, the issue with that is if you do do the indie route, it is more expensive as an yes. upfront. Um, but if you do make that upfront investment, uh, you get a much bigger payout on the back end. So very good example about this. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, my TJ series here uh, currently yes. is um, uh, under option to be made into a motion picture. All of that money that um, went to acquiring those rights went to me. It didn't go to like a publisher and then I got like the peanuts off of, you know, the back right. end of that because they had the they had the rights for the film and TV or something like that. Um, so while, yes, I was broke for a long time there, you know, because I had to put all this upfront costs or like even like you met me at like Comic-Con, I have to put yeah. the up cost to get those tables or to get those booths and, th and things like that. Um, but on the back end, uh, the reward is that much sweeter because it's all going to you 100 percent. Like There's no like. 50% split or 25% split. Sometimes there's 8% uh, um, uh, splits for print uh, print copies and things like that. <clears throat> so um, yeah, like I, I, I've i always been pretty militant about being indie and doing it myself, um, knowing that it is a, it, it can be a slower and, and tougher hill to climb. Mm -hmm. uh, but knowing that if you do find success, then your success is going to be very major. Definitely. And I also like to take a moment to like just add to what um, Antoine said, like for people who go the independent route, yes, you do have more creative control over your work, but you have to really understand that it's all on you. It's yep. not like a, oh, I'm just going to go the independent route. You really have to consider if you're going to make your books independently, 
you have to pay for a cover artist. You have to, you know, buy your own ISBNs. Editors. You have to, yes. Beta editors to <laughs> marketing. <laughs> yes. Ads on Facebook, on Amazon, you know, you got all that's out of your pocket. It is. And if you don't have the mindset or at least are not willing to go into that business side of being an author, mm -hmm. then you will definitely struggle a bit. But if you do, then just as, um, as one said, there will be a huge uh, payout at the end. All authors go through struggles, regardless if it's, you know, traditional publishing, hybrid publishing, or indie publishing. There's going to be hurdles and trials along the way. But if you can switch off the writer side and then go to the mm -hmm. business side, you're going to do much better. And speaking of the business side, yeah, I was gonna say it's very funny you mentioned that about like switching your mind from business yes. to creative because that's what I'm dealing with literally right now. So the third book, <laughs> TJ, is about to be done, and I'm trying my best. And this is hard to do because you have to wear multiple hats, right, as an indie author. Mm -hmm. um, I'm at the point now, like the publisher Antoine is like, "Hey, writer Antoine, you have to get done. This book is out in February. You should be done already at this point." Um, so I have like. Uh, it's a, it's a weird melding of minds and also they're conflicting because like the creative side of me is like no but i just need like another month to like do this and like no you need like complete a drafting kind of thing so you know you and you have to do that you have to be accountable to yourself um which yes. is hard for some people sometimes you might need like an author group or a set of friends to like you know keep you accountable uh because yeah you at, at, at some point during the process you have to stop being a writer and you have to be a business person <laughs> definitely 100 percent. and on that topic of business person we're now going to focus on the other aspects of the author's journey, which is, you know, the marketing side. And probably the biggest one when it comes to marketing is, of course, knowing who your audience is. Now, mm -hmm. for us authors, we know we're the target audience because we enjoy these stories. But when we publish these works, we have to consider, OK, who's going to enjoy this type of story? If it's going to be in the fantasy genre, OK, we have the market for the fantasy genre. Now we have to really figure out, OK, is there a subgenre that exists that there is a good audience size? And that's where you have to really hit the nail on the head with the hammer to just really showcase our work. So, Antoine, for you, for all of the stories that you've written, do you have a good understanding of your audience? And in your opinion, when should the author take into consideration the audience for their works? Oh, I think uh, audiences, well, it depends on what your goal is in the author, that, that, that's first and foremost, because you could just mm. be a writer who just, you know, wants to do this as like a hobby, or you're just doing it as an expression, you know, just an art, right. artistic expression. And if that's the case, then yeah, like write literary fiction, and you know, you won't sell a lot of copies, but you'll feel fulfilled, like in, in an artistic sense. Then there's the other side, like then if you want to actually and I, I'm kind of two minds, though I am more on the side of like being commercial and wearing, writing popular fiction, because in my mind, it's if I want to continue doing this thing that I like doing, then I need to make money off of it so that I right. can like continue the process. Right. Because if the second I don't, then I'm like, all right, well, can't do this anymore, you know, because it's just not sustainable. Um, so I lean heavily into audience. Um, I have an extensive uh, beta reading process. Mm. So after I finish a draft, uh, I write in what I call sequences or kind of like episodes. So let's say like someone has like a three act structure in their book, right? I might mm -hmm. have like several sequences within an act. So like act one might have like two or three sequences and each sequence contains like four or five chapters. Uh, so I write very episodically in my mind. Mm, okay. And then I put that out to readers. So I'm like, hey, here's episode one. Here's episode two. Like, what do you think? You know, kind of a thing. And I take that feedback and I, I'm, I'm kind of a glutton for um, for feedback. Like, I want to yes. hear it before I put the book out. Like, I don't want to hear this stuff, like, when when it's a review on Amazon or Goodreads or something like that. And I'm like, oh, man, I should have totally wrote that differently or whatever. I do that from the get-go with beta readers who read my stuff, like, throughout the entire process so that I can actually apply those notes based on reader expectations. Um, and I can't tell you how many times I've rewritten my books based on beta reader feedback um, and, 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 and making sure that reader expectations are met so that when I do put out a book, people actually buy the book and so I can uh, uh, pay into the next book and the next project that I want to do. Definitely, 100%. And I'm all the same mindset as well. 
when I had my third boy that came out, um, say, was it two months ago? I can't, yeah, two months ago in September, it was Michael, Last Angel of Earth. When I started that book, I did not announce it until like probably the middle of summer as a little mm -hmm. teaser. I wanted to do something different that I hadn't done for my previous two books. I didn't do beta readers or arc readers for The Gathering and Aminus. They were successful. They were like my first two that people really enjoy, but I wanted it to be different from my other two books and the rest going forward. So for Michael, I did do arc readers and it was, you know, really, really helpful. And now with my fourth book that I'm working on, or it's already finished, but now I'm getting beta readers for it because I want to get the feedback to also improve upon before I submit to my editor, which is another thing. The one thing that is, you know, definitely a detriment to the process is not having your book, you know, pre-reviewed before you go to the editor. Yes, the editor's job is to review the book, give you feedback, but it definitely helps the editor's job more when there's already not that much that needs to be changed. Yes, there's going to be some maybe grammatical issues here and there or structures here and there. But if the entire book needs to be edited, that's maybe like three, six months of work that the editor doesn't have to do necessarily. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, it, it I've been saying this from the beginning, like you, what you submit to your editor should be what you would try to publish. Because if you're making your editor do small stuff, they're going to miss like the things that you actually want changed. Because if they're just spending time, like putting commas in, you know, in, in, in places or like, you know, trying to fix how you put quotations in or M dashes or whatever it might be, like some menial technical thing, then they're not going to help you with like the thing you actually want right. to get help with, <clears throat> which is, you know, write a very engaging story. You, you know, you want them to focus in on one thing and they can't do that <laughs> if it's in a really rough state. Definitely. And also I'm going to switch these two questions around is now the readership. Cause we talked about the audience, which, you know, is important, but at the end of the day, it's the individual readers who are picking up our books, reading it and reviewing it, which I will say reviews are very helpful to authors. It's not about how many copies you sell. It's all about the reviews and the people because reviews draw people in to look at books. And we'll probably go on that a little bit later in the interview. But going back to readership, readership is important because normally, yes, you want to target your readership and your audience, but your readership can also be different too. And that is a good thing. Like case in point, I had two guests on the show. It was my first dual interview. They were the authors of uh, Nuclear Power, which mm -hmm. was an alternate history uh, story by Fanbase Press. And imagine a world where the Bay of Pigs invasion led to a nuclear holocaust, where it turned the United States into that universe's Cuba, with the original 13 states ruled by the Joint Chiefs of Staffs. They were pretty much, you know, marketing towards, you know, people who love X-Men, people who love thrillers, dystopian worlds, etc., the readership they were not expecting were people that grew up during the 60s at the height of the Cold War. Because, according to them, their interaction with these readers was astonishing. One reader even said, you probably wrote the closest thing that actually would have happened. And that's yeah, so funny. incredible. So, yeah. So, for you, Antoine, do you have a good idea of your readership and for your individual stories... Have you found it challenging to like switch um, genres and age groups? And what I mean is from writing, you know, general adult fiction to then just switching over to a young adult story, which has its own set of rules and uh, guidelines you have to follow. Yeah, I mean, you're definitely going to lose a readership if you're going to switch genres, which is why people say when you write, especially genre fiction, uh, that you keep it in the same family. So like, you know, um, one might advise like, hey, if you're going to be a thriller author, you you probably want to like just write thrillers. Um, you don't want to like switch between like I'm writing a thriller this guy and I'm writing a horror and now I'm writing a lit RPG and now I'm writing like you know medieval fantasy. You know, <clears throat> you want to like kind of keep it consistent. Um, and that and, and that's true even within like the subgenre. So I write mm -hmm. you know mostly in in fantasy. And yeah, like before I used to write uh, adult fiction before I moved on to 
YA contemporary fiction, which is, you know, uh, a whole, not a whole lot different. I mean, still fantasy, but it's a different, you know, kind of right. set of rules because uh, you have like contemporary settings where it's like a hidden world kind of situation. And then you know, have my more old timey stuff with like by sea and sky and the Kishi. Um, so, yeah, you have to like, you know, be wary of that um, because you are going to acquire new readers, but you're also going to lose readers whenever you, yes. um, you switch over. Definitely. And also on the topic of readership, it's also important if you do uh, switch genres to really make sure you understand your uh, readership. And Antoine already talked about this, but if you do switch genres, you do have to switch your writing styles. And I'll give mm -hmm. an example. There are many books that are marketed to the YA audience, but upon further reading, they're not YA. They need another round of it. I've seen Man, that. Yeah, YA is in such a weird spot. Like, why has always had an issue of like genre identity. It's always been so it's so fluctuated. Yeah, it 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 absolutely is. And it's a challenge. It's really a struggle. So for it too, because people have said that like review like we were talking about reviews before. Um reviewers who who read my YA books in particular uh, are always impressed with how teenager my teenage characters are because apparently in YA there's an issue right now where like these teenage characters are really just adults <laughs> like like they act like oh adults, yes but in teenage bodies or whatever and people when they read my books are like oh yeah that's right they act like teenagers <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm like yeah uh, how else does that be because I and that's the thing um I don't often always know like what's going on with like the industry and like trends and things like that all the time right. like I'm somewhat familiar but not always but i didn't know it was a trend right now that like you know young adult characters don't sound like young adults um but i'm glad to know that i wrote it properly and that people were appreciating you know the fact that i wrote teen characters that act like teenagers definitely and a lot of my uh guests i've had on the show who write ya they've had the same experience that a lot of their readers are finding it a breath of fresh air that these teenage characters are acting like teenagers that it fits the age group and the world that they exist in. So that is, you know, really, really powerful. Mm -hmm. And now the next question, which I'm really interested to hear your thoughts on Antoine, which I'll give a little context to this one. Mm -hmm. So initially the question I've always asked my guests is, you know, who are your favorite authors who have helped mold your voice into what it is now? And I had a guest on the show earlier this year, uh, shout out to Eric Bowden, who, just kind of switched it and turned on its head and actually probably gave a really, really good point. Because, you know, for us authors, we're always going to be inspired by the stories we've read growing up. That mm -hmm. is without a doubt. But at the end of the day, it's our own voice that's showcasing through our stories. It's not mm -hmm. Stephen King. It's not George R. R. Martin. It's not C.S. Lewis. It's not Stephen Arian. It's not all these other authors uh, in the world. And that's a balancing act between showing, you know, respect and reverence to the stories that we grew up with, but also showcasing our individuality. Because I'm curious, Antoine, how many times have you seen a book that has had the tagline, so-and-so meets so-and-so, or the blend of, I'll give okay, a good point, Dinosaur Knights, probably one of my favorite series, had this by George R. R. Martin. It's as if Game of Thrones and Jurassic Park had a baby. I've never read either of those books, but I initially knew, and I loved it. I absolutely loved that series. But now that I'm an author, I look at it from a very different perspective because I don't want to be, like, you know, pigeonholed in a box, as, as we were talking before, like, from switching from one genre to another. I mm -hmm. want to showcase that I can be multi-genre. I can write different stories. I don't want to be pigeonholed into one category or be one style writer. So for you, Antoine, with all the books you've written, how have you balanced the two, the sources and the books you've read growing up as a kid, but also showcasing your individuality as an author and a person? Uh, I think it just comes by naturally. So <clears throat> as most writers will tell you, the best way to be a writer is to read um, because you're naturally going to pull from what you enjoy um, in your readership. <clears throat> Not your readership, but in, in reading, like the style that you'll pick up, like um, like I like a lot of widowed paragraphs. I think that's what they're called, where you have like you know the the one sentence um, uh, paragraph to like give greater impact. You see that a lot in young adult fiction. Yes, and I remember getting that. I think initially from either 
Animorphs uh, by Kay Applegate, like way back in the day, like that middle grade series where the kids turn to animals to face off aliens. Yes. Um, or um, it was a book called Hatchet, which oh, I forgot who the author of Hatchet was. But I remember Hatchet having a lot of like those like widowed one word or one sentence um, uh, paragraphs. Let me see. Uh, Hatchet was written by gary paulson uh and yes. yeah i remember that being like a, a a big one for me so yeah it's just like if you read a lot you'll naturally start acquiring things that you like from other authors and things like that like i love love the idea of like playing with perspectives which i got the idea from from nk jemison's fifth season mm. uh where she uh plays with like the second person pov and i have a thing right now i'm dealing with right now in my tj series where i'm messing around with pov and the switching of that um uh, of course, like, yeah, the character interactions, like, uh, like the Harry Potter characters is, like, a big influence to me uh, as well. Uh, I always like the simplicity of George R. R. Martin's um, prose, for example. So there's, there's little things that you acquire. Like, I, I like this element from this, and I like this element from this. And right. This, and that's how you, like, you know, make your own style. Yes, because I think at the end of the day, for all of us authors, we don't want to imitate or replicate someone else's style of writing because... You know, at the end of the day, we're all in the same boat. We're all trying to showcase our work. We're all trying to get our name out there. And that leads now to my favorite question of the interview, which, again, I'll lay context for this one because, brace yourself, Antoine, this is a big one. This is a heavy hitter, mm-hmm. as I always like to mm-hmm. say. So I've been doing podcasting for now five years in total. Two years just audio, well, actually, no, three years audio, two years now on YouTube. And meeting all the authors that I've met right now, which I think is now, I want to say up to 90 authors nice. just in general. Thank yeah. you. And just learning so many different stuff, so many different people learning from them at different stages of their life. It's just incredible. And the advice they give on these shows is equally incredible that I've come to this realization that there's two paths for authors, regardless of what journey you go on, traditional, indie, or hybrid. And that's to be an author and to be known as an author. To be an author is an individual dedicated to the art of storytelling, not motivated solely by capital, but it's nice to get a little money here and there. To be an author is an individual dedicated to marketing, showcasing their work on social media, going on shows, podcasts like these, getting their name out there to build their brand. And both paths have their own trials and hurdles, but they all lead to the same ending. But I definitely feel for first-time authors or, yeah, first-time authors who are now going into the publishing industry who want to go down the second path, that leads to a lot of unrealistic goals and expectations. And one advice I got from an old guest, uh, Natalie Wright, author of Season of the Dragon, said this. In this industry, there's no guarantee your debut novel is going to be the start of your legacy or give you the gratification that you're looking for. There are exceptions to the rule, of course. There are many authors whose first works did give them that status, and that is not an easy feat to do. And they should get all the credit they get. But generally speaking, you have this roller coaster Mm -hmm. of highs and lows where you are now trying to follow the trends, follow what's popular, and where you're writing not to write anymore, you're not passionate about it, you're just writing to join the trends, which is not a good thing, generally speaking, because trends come and go. And your readership is going to pick up that your writing style is going to change. It's just like in films. You would have one good film with one director and the continuation in the sequel, entirely different director, and the storytelling is completely off. Viewers are instantly going to know that. Same thing with readers, too, when it comes to books. So Mm -hmm. ultimately, Antoine, what is your thoughts on this, that in this industry, there is no guarantee your first book is going to guarantee your legacy or stardom, but it should not deter you from creating stories if that's something you truly want to do Uh, that's huge i actually think there's there's several authors i have already popping up in my mind right now who i'm like you need to just put out your books because like some people just don't publish right they'll they'll, they'll write all the time and they have like i have this big magnum opus that i've been working on for years i'm like but where is it you know like like you don't even know if it's going to be successful or not because you really truly don't know if a book's going to work until you put it out 
Um, like you can you can you can think it will do well. You, you think the genre is really hot at the moment or whatever. You think people are gonna connect with your characters, but you really truly are not gonna know until you put it put it out. And you have to go through that process of putting it out um, to to I feel gain the ability to to understand what you, you what kind of writer what kind of author you're going to be in this space um so a huge thing for me is like write and publish like more imp importantly publish whether you're publishing it traditionally or doing it indie like publish don't just sit there yes. like working on your one project because before you know it it's like 10 years and you're like oh wow wow i could have been like writing so many other stories or if you do have your magnum opus or whatever and it's not coming out just write something else just write something else just to put it out there so you can like get in the process and this is of course if your goal is to be a a genre writer or a career writer like there's a difference between being like again like i said before being a career writer and then just kind of like writing for the pleasure of it as right an artistic expression because it is two worlds there is a commercial aspect to it and there is an artistic part of it um and it really depends on one's individual goals but if your goal is that you would like to you know make it a career and make it sustainable, then yes, you, you, you gotta put your stuff out. <laughs> Definitely. And also to add to that, um, shout out to Sabrina Borman for this, because this was really, really insightful. If you're going to go down the career path of being a commercial author and you want to showcase your work, as well as, let's say, if you are an established commercial author, but you want to try a different genre, write what you're afraid of. Write what you're afraid of because you never know what you're capable of. And when she said mm -hmm. that, it really made sense because, you know, we always write what we know, generally speaking, that that's our comfort zone. But write what you're afraid of. Write a story that you typically would not write from a story that you probably would not normally pick up and see what you can do. When I tried that a few years ago, I wrote a short story called Hellhounds werewolves fighting the germans in world war one I. I absolutely loved it and i didn't know i could write a little bit of horror to it and that's the thing never uh confine yourself to one genre experiment see what you can do because you never know what you're capable of and that comes with you know experience training as well as meeting people to help you and speaking of people Antoine, are there any authors you would like to give a shout out to who have helped you understand the industry a little bit better, as well as family members and friends who have also been by your side uh, since the beginning of this journey? Oh, I'm going to say uh, Ben Wolf. Uh, ben Wolf is a big one. Um, he got me, his big contribution is that he got me into live events. The reason why you even met me at Los Angeles, you would not have met me at Los Angeles Comic Con if it was not for Ben Wolf. Um, but he's really? a really good fantasy sci fi writer. Definitely look him up. Uh, super, super awesome guy. And he does a bunch of uh, live events, but he does it more like in the Midwest, I think like in Iowa and Idaho and stuff like that. Um, which, but he kills it. Like he kills it out there. Like, he actually is about to get shipped out to the Middle East. Like, he has a, a conference out in Arabia. <laughs> like, that, wow. that, that's, that's like, the level that he's at now with live events. Um, so I'm trying to get to that level, too. Wow. Any other authors or people you met on social media you'd like to give a shout-out to? Uh, Jessica Cage. I just, like, really admire her her drive. Um, and uh, Yuma Yori Wilson. Uh, those two are, like the epitome of like work ethic and just like like i was saying before putting out books like and not finding success right away right like jessica cage i think she's been publishing for like the last 10 years um and she had like her last like mega success just last year but it's not just like you're not waiting for just that one swell like what she was doing was she had like a lot of this right like a lot of yeah. this, and and then she had like one of these moments so she's so right now she's going through like a, a big peaking moment right now um but she had a lot of like a lot of small victories and like you know an, an, an ascension up to the culmination of this like latest project that she did which was called um uh, i accidentally summoned an, a, a demon boyfriend uh, which is a Ooh. mega success for her like thousands of reviews on amazon uh, because she built up her readership and you know built it little by little and now she's like you know there so i really admire that about her that she was you know she's she's put in the work awesome now before we get to the uh final question i do want to get to the question that i've been wanting to ask you out to one so when you began writing and diving into um, African mythology and blending it into fantasy, were you a little apprehensive and nervous 
in the sense of are people going to accept this? Because as I said, generally speaking, when readers think of fantasy, they think of like fantasy in medieval Europe or maybe on sometimes um, Arabia or the Islamic world, China, or even Japan. We don't really consider, generally speaking, fantasy in the continent of Africa. But meeting you and seeing your work, I am, I am like blown away by the fact that, you know, the stories, especially like by Sea and Sky, I am blown away by it. I'm like thinking, why have these stories never been written before? And why has there not been a lot of, you know, marketing about this? And another book I'll also mention, which is a blend of not just African uh, folklore mythology, but also um, Islamic mythology and folklore, The Final Strife by Sara El Arifi, which reading that book, oh my gosh, absolutely loved it. So can you give us your thoughts on that? And has it changed with the success of your projects going forward? Can you reset the question really quick? It was just that... Um... Uh, how did I, how, how I think it was going to be received when I first did it? Yes. So when yes, so when you decided to write your fantasy stories, but also combine African folklore mythology, oh, yes, gotcha. were you hesitant? Or, yeah, I wasn't yeah, hesitant, hesitant because I'm a little bit uh, combative and confrontational with that kind of stuff sometimes. <laughs> where I'm like, oh, I don't care. Because uh, with my first book, I remember putting it out. Um, and I got like a review from like some author group um, and they were like, I don't know if this is going to sell. This doesn't look like it's like in a in a genre that's like, you know, healthy or whatever like that. And then like, you know, the next year I got like a movie deal and I was like, F you guys. You know what I mean? Like, so I was, I've always been very kind of like combative about that. But it's important not to be too combative because you do need to listen to all feedback, in my opinion. Um, mm. Because, again, if you're trying to write commercial fiction, if you're trying to acquire capital from the products that you sell so that you can continue doing it you do have to listen to the masses a little bit but you also have to understand when not to listen to the masses at the same right. time it's a hard thing it's a hard thing to uh, uh to balance and i think that is the challenge of, of of being a commercial writer um is knowing when to listen to the industry and when not to listen to the industry absolutely and as a final question to this incredible interview antoine with everything you've learned thus far, the stories you've written, the people you've met, the people who have helped you understand the industry a little bit better, and your own trial and error, what is your word of wisdom to fellow authors who want to get a head start in this industry and authors who want to transition from writers who are hobbyists to commercial writers? Uh, well, if you're trying to make that transition, you have to do something called the right to market. Um, and you can do that in one of two ways. You can do it by writing the story first and then figuring out what the market for your book is. Or, and this is probably the more successful way to do it, is to study the market first and write a story that you enjoy that overlaps with that current trend. For example, currently right now, the, the the most popular genre is romantic fantasy. Like that, that is yes. having its heyday right now. Um, again, like I said, Je Jessica Cage was who I mentioned a while ago. She did the mm -hmm. accidentally summoned a demon boyfriend. Like um, she, she did that right. So she liked that storyline. She wanted to try something, but with um, with demons and vampires and things like that. Um, but you also have to figure out, okay, what is the trend right now? You can see that from her career. Like if you look at all her her books, they they always try to hit um whatever trope is happening like a few years ago was the bil billionaire romance was like the big thing and lit rpg is like kind of coming up right now as well right um so what you need to do is first market research um look at what is selling what is popular what are readers hungry for and then find out what you like as an individual and how that overlaps with yes that that, that specific genre and you will won't say you will find success, but you are more likely to find success um, by following that route. That's probably some of the best advice I've ever gotten on the show, Antoine. Thank you so much for that. And that concludes this amazing author interview. I may just have a playlist of just LA Comic Con guests, because I think now, Antoine, you're probably like four or four my fourth or fifth guest from LA Comic-Con making, yeah, Comic cool. 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 yeah. <laughs> making their official debut here on the channel. Now, Antoine, before we end today, 
Yeah. Where can people find you on social media to reach out to you, follow you, stay up to date with your current project, as well as purchase copies of your books? If you go to AntoineBandele.com, that's A-N-T-O-I-N-E, B-A-N-D-E-L-E.com, you'll find everything on me. You'll find my social media. You'll find my books. You'll find everything right there. One, one stop. Awesome. I will link all that down below in the description of this video and be on the lookout for my review of by Sea and Sky, Sky Pirate Chronicles, because I got to tell you, I love this. I love this book. I really, really enjoy it. And it's a nice refresher for me from the hardcore fantasy that I've been reading for the last three weeks. So this mm -hmm. is a nice refresher and I absolutely love it. And again, a huge thank you to Antoine for coming on the show. We wish him the very best in his success. And I cannot wait to see what the world has in store for him. And as always, viewers and listeners, like, subscribe, and comment down below what was your favorite part of the interview. And as always, this is the Wandering Scribe and the Wandering Quill signing out. Wishing you all a wonderful day, afternoon, or evening wherever you are in the world.